what is the aftermath of these severe crises? And what are the features? Uh, and why, why are we still, the crisis began in 2007. The real intense period was the fall of 2008. And here we are in 2011, and we still have a lingering high unemployment issue. We still have very soft, if not outright weak, uh, real estate prices and more broadly real estate markets. Um, but importantly, we have something that is very difficult to overcome. And I don't want to sound like a wet rag, but it is difficult to overcome, which is why these crises cast a long shadow, which is a debt overhang. <laughs> uh, private debt, household debt, is still near record highs in the United States. That is true in Europe. Uh, that is true to a lesser degree in Japan. Uh, public debt in the U.S. is close to the levels that we had right after World War II. Public debt is even higher in many countries in Europe. And Japan is frankly off the charts. At the end of 2010, public debt to GDP in Japan was 225%. Um, emerging markets are a completely different picture right now. Uh, and I will try to document why this disparate performance between the advanced economies and emerging markets. Emerging markets, which are have been the hot spot uh, in post-World War II with lots of frequent crises. You don't have to go further back than the 1990s. 1994, 95, we had the Mexican peso crisis, which spread through Latin America. 1997, 1998, we started with the Thai crisis, which spread to Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, all of Asia, in varying degrees. When we thought, like Jobs, it was safe to put our foot back in the water, Russia crisis, 1998. Brazil, January of 1999. Argentina, 2001, you get the picture. So emerging markets, which had been the very volatile, very rocky spot, are now, importantly, because there was, while the advanced economies were taking on more debt, notably private debt, uh, the emerging markets during the 2000s were deleveraging. So actually, and this is not seat of the pants, this is something that I will document uh, shortly. Um, and that has made them quite resilient uh, at present. But they also face another challenge, which has to do with the advanced economy macroeconomic policies, namely, we have exceptionally low interest rates globally. QE2 in the United States, quantitative easing. Uh, similar moves in Europe, in Japan. So with interest rates in the advanced economy being as low as they are, there is a search for yield of higher rates of returns in emerging markets, which means that emerging markets right now are attracting a lot of capital inflows from abroad. Normally, one would say that's a good thing. But like most things, you can have too much of a good thing. And when we hear about emerging markets, we hear about inflationary pressures uh, bubbling up. This is an issue in China, where I visited in January of this year. Even in the more informal discussion with Chinese officials, they will tell you, we actually think that the official numbers understate the extent of inflationary pressures at present. It's true in India, it's true in Latin America, in varying degrees. So I, I will try to, in as much as possible, I'm noted for rambling, so I know I, I need a cue, where's, where's my cue, oh, there you are. Okay, he's gonna wave at me so I don't go overboard. Uh, but in the remaining period that I have, I'll try to address some of the outlook issues. 
bringing in the historic perspective and trying to address the outlook issues of what our world looks like in the next few years. Um, so, European risks. Uh, this is what I call debt withdrawal. And how many of you picked up the newspaper today and saw Portugal? Okay. So, you know, uh, we started 2010 with the Greek crisis. We concluded 2010 with the Irish crisis. Now we're into Portugal. We're expanding our European horizons here. But the theme in Europe really can be appropriately called from financial crash to debt crisis, which is a title of a paper that Ken Rogoff and I have recently written for the American Economic Review that will be published in the American Economic Review. And the basic theme, bear me out for a moment, and in, with less drama, but it applies to the United States also, is you start, you start out with a, a period of a boom. This is the period which, for lack of a better term, everybody's a genius. You know, everybody's a genius in a bull market. Um, and so you have rising asset prices. You have pretty good economic growth. You have relatively low unemployment. During that boom phase of the asset uh, cycle, debts, private debts, build up, largely in part because we expect the asset price boom to continue forever. Um, then that excess borrowing begins to turn sour. Loans begin to turn bad, and asset prices begin to contract. This is the onset of a financial crisis. Now, having learned from the policy mistakes of the Great Depression in the 1930s, the government steps in with stimulus packages to help revive the economy. But that also creates government debt. But even if the government doesn't step in with stimulus packages, the government's going to, this is one of the things that Ken and I highlighted a couple of years back. Tax revenues fall off a cliff during a financial crisis. So even absent stimulus, even absent bailout costs, lower government revenues means a big, big budget deficit and a big build up in debt. And in Europe, in Greece, in Ireland, in Portugal, and to a lesser degree in Spain, the financial crisis has morphed into a debt crisis, a fiscal debt crisis. That's what we call debt with drama. Now, debt without drama is more applicable, broadly defined, to all the advanced economies, whether they are close to a sovereign debt crisis or not. And that is, what are the implications of high levels of debt for economic growth? Why is it that the advanced economies are mired in a slump right now. It's not a depression. It's not, you know, necessarily a recession anymore. Because that we're, we're but a slump, uh, a, a period of subpar activity. Uh, and why are emerging markets doing better? Well, let me point to the charts. In the left panel, the bar chart shows gross external debt as a percent of GDP by region and country groups. The right panel shows a bar chart of whether the countries increased their debt load from 2003 to 2009 or reduced it. And what I would point out is that the region that we hear the most about in terms of debt difficulties right now in Europe, just check out the top bar. And let me say this, that when you look at that average debt to GDP for European countries, there is no such thing as your average European country. 
and at the other extreme, as I highlighted, uh, uh, Asian and Latin American and African emerging markets have much lower levels of debt and have reduced their debt levels uh, during the 2000s. Now, Japan is an interesting case uh, worth mentioning here. Japan has, of course, been receiving massive attention in the media because of the horrible natural disaster that's befallen them. Uh, if I were to come and tell you, I know of a country whose public debts last year were 225% of GDP, and this year will probably be above 260% of GDP. I would tell you that country is going to be facing a near default, if not an outright default. Why hasn't this happened in Japan? Well, look there. Most of the debt Japan has is domestically held. This is pension funds, it's financial institutions, they do not borrow much externally. That's something that I will come back to later on in my lecture. Uh, so where are we? Uh, as I tried to highlight early on, what I'm trying to do is trace out what the history tells us where, where we're going. One of the things that we highlighted in our work on the aftermath of financial crises is that financial crises passed the long shaft. And, you know, it was to me stunning in the financial press how long it has taken for the realization that your average post-World War II recession, I think, is not a good benchmark for comparing where we are now. Because the average post-World War II recession in the United States lasted less than a year. And the average post-World War II recession in the United States did not involve a record nearly 40% decline in real estate prices, which is unprecedented in the history of the housing market as measured by Kay Schiller. Uh, that series begins in 1890. Uh, so we suggested, our, our Ryan Martin Krogar suggested that the consequences uh, were lingering increases in government debt because of poor economic activity, because of slow recovery. And in January of 2009, when we presented these results at the American Economic Association meetings, what this bar chart showed when we presented it there, we highlighted that this bar chart simply shows that if you look at the worst post World War II financial crisis, uh, the average increase in public debt, this is not public debt as a percent of GDP, but real public debt nearly doubles. So if in the year of the crisis, debt is equal to 100, it equals 186 three years later. In other words, it's almost twice as big. Uh, when, they, you know, a number of people commented that we were being so, somewhat sensationalist at the time when we put out these numbers. Now they actually look quite modest relative to what we've seen in a number of countries. Now, here's the depth of drama that we're seeing in Europe. Public debt buildups historically have ended up with a high incidence of default. And let me define default, okay? Because, and don't let the financial press fool you. Uh, Anything that changes the terms, that makes the lender worse off, when maturities are extended, when interest rate costs are trimmed, that's a restructure. And a restructuring is a partial default. So when people talk, is Greece going to default? They're actually talking about, is Greece going to default on its private creditors? Because it's already defaulted on its official credit. The package announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, which entailed a lengthening of maturities and a trimming of interest rates, 
our official president is a restructuring. But it's not yet a private restructuring. Uh, it's an official restructuring. So what does this chart show? Just very quickly. The blue line is simply public debt to GDP. It's a plain vanilla arithmetic average for 70 countries, which account for about 95% of world GDP. The yellow shading is the share of countries in default or restructuring. But let's bring it to the so so bottom bottom line. Whenever public debt has soared so quickly, spiked so quickly, as we have seen in the last few years, look at those last observations to your left there, okay? Uh, whenever the, the public debt has risen worldwide, that much the worldwide incidence of default deficit has increased with it. Uh, so I am, on the basis of the analysis and the work that I have done over the many years, I am one of those people who expects that the European situation isn't going to avoid a variety of restructurings for countries like Ireland, Greece, Portugal. There may be others, but those three, I, I don't think restructuring is avoidable. Uh, even with very large sums of assistance, which they are uh, no doubt getting. Just to put this in perspective, um, you know, people are accustomed to hearing, well, you know, um, Ghana defaulted, or Ecuador defaulted, Argentina defaulted. But the idea that a European country is defaulting is somewhat more uh, has a more of a novelty ring. But let, let's, let's go back to history for a moment here. What this chart shows is public debt to GDP for Greece from 1848 onwards. Okay? Greece obtained independence in 1830. The yellow shape, I, mean, I didn't have uh, data for the period 1830 to 1847, so the series begins in 48. But the yellow shape years in default or restructuring. And in effect, since independence, Greece has been uh, in a state of default or restructuring about 48% of the time. Bottom line, default or restructuring is nothing new. And I can go down that the advanced economies do not have the impeccable credit history that everyone thinks they have. In 1933, the United States defaulted on its treasury gold obligations. The abrogation of the gold clause was nothing less than a default because anything that changes the terms. So if you had bought a treasury bond in 1919 or 1920, it, that treasury bond had a clause that said that's payable in gold. In 1933, that clause was scratched, and it was only payable in currency, in dollars. But guess what? The dollar, the gold content of the dollar had fallen by about a third. So what I'm saying is these things that we now sort of look at with shock and awe is because we have focused 
highlight here is that 91.6 of the observations for all the advanced economies, all of them, from the entire period of 96 to 2009, 91.6 of the observations had a debt below 90%, which means that only about eight of the observations are in the region in which we currently are right now in the US. Um, so if you know debt is a great idea, uh, and it's you know, you, you would think that it wouldn't be this rare. If debt didn't have deleterious consequences, you would see uh, more uh, a higher a higher likelihood. Politicians would be quite tolerant. Uh, of higher levels of debt. After all, it's much easier to get indebted than to work the debt down. Uh, so, our basic result was that uh, at 90% uh, or higher, uh, growth deteriorates and median growth rates fall by about 1%, and average growth rates fall by about more, and that's what this graph shows you the, uh, the, well, a different way of saying it actually is that there's a whole range of debt outcomes in which there's no relationship between debt and growth. Because it doesn't matter whether you have 30% debt or 60% debt from the growth standpoint. It doesn't, it's only when it gets to very high levels that uh, you have a problem. Now, uh, so, at the end of my talk, I will try to address the issue of the problem of not having a silver bullet. That is, there is no real easy, uh, pain-free way of reducing high levels of debt. There, there's just not, it's, it's easier to build that up than to bring it down. And so, this is, I, I don't mean to come here and be a wet rag, but I, I think these are issues that we need to be aware of. I think the idea of quick fixes uh, are not not really founded on the on the historical experience. But now let me turn to emerging markets because I want to remain in the spirit of the international scope of this wonderful uh, Gordon tradition. Uh, what about emerging markets? The emerging market problem is a different problem right now. Uh, they're not uh, highly indebted right now. I mean, if you look at Latin America in the, early, in, the, in the 1980s, then the problems were quite similar. The debt overhead, that the, what the so-called lost decade of Latin America had importantly to do with a huge debt overhead, public and private debt, uh, and, and, and a very, you know, Mark deterioration uh, in, in, in the economies and in the standard of living in many Latin countries. But that's not the situation that emerging markets are in right now. Um, emerging markets have to be very careful, though, about borrowing a lot because emerging markets, uh, what I want to reiterate is that emerging markets, while their tolerance for debt, for public debt, according to our work, is not that different from the advanced economies. Their tolerance for external debt is not very high. This is what Ken Roebuck, Miguel Sebastián, and I have called debt intolerance. Uh, and, and so that the, if you look, and this is not, this is, you can go back to the, the work in our book and another work, debt intolerance is nowhere more I think clearly manifested that if you were to look at every single emerging market default since 1945, you will find that the majority, over 50% of those defaults, were at debt to G GDP levels, external debt to GDP levels. I would have met the master criteria. And the master criteria is 60%. Okay, so. It, it, the idea of, of an emerging market getting to, you know, debt to GDP of 500, which is roughly where the UK is, or 1,000, which is roughly where Ireland is, 
or over 200, which is worth races, that's just unthinkable. Emerging markets start to have problems at much lower levels of debt. That's why they're also policymakers in emerging markets are so worried about getting big capital inflows. Because, let me put it in English, capital inflows, if you have a capital inflows, it means you have a current account deficit, a trade deficit. And capital inflows is a polite way of saying you're borrowing from the rest of the world. Okay? And so if you look at all the advanced economies that have had big time crises, in 2007, the United States, the UK, Ireland, Iceland, Spain, Greece, and so on, all of them had large capital inflows. We have been borrowing and continue to do so from the rest of the world. That's a dangerous proposition, especially, it's a dangerous proposition for anyone, as we're finding, but it's a particularly dangerous proposition for emerging markets which have lower debt tolerance. Um, now, these large capital inflows, um, they don't come out of the blue. You look at, right now, the financial industry. The financial industry, uh, is dealing with nominal interest rates in the advanced economies that are very low. Real estate markets are very depressed, so rates of return on real estate are, are limited to negative. And that's not just a U.S. issue. I actually collected data for real estate housing prices globally to the extent possible, because this is a series that, you know, it's, it, it really is the proverbial needle in the haystack finding reliable real estate value. <laughs> but to the extent possible, the pattern of the boom and then the subsequent loss is, is, is very much not just the U.S. phenomenon. So nominal interest rates are low, returns on bonds are low, real estate is not a, a, attractive. So what is attractive? Well, the equity market has been volatile, you know, done pretty well, but emerging markets have been presenting a higher rate of return alternative, and so capital has been flooding, and these large capital inflows, however, have historically tended to end badly. Now, uh, these capital flow bonanzas, for example, what does this chart tell us? I'm going to show you several of these charts, so let me explain them in as much as I can explain it properly. The red bar, this is by country, the red bar is the probability of a, having a banking crisis for that particular country. You know, the unconditional probability. That's the odds that we'll have a banking crisis at any given year based on your historic pattern. The blue bar is the probability that you will have a banking crisis if you get getting a lot of capital inflows. So if capital inflows are a dangerous proposition, the odds that you will have a banking crisis are bigger if you're borrowing from the rest of the world than if you're not. This is what this, this is essentially showing. You're more vulnerable to banking crisis. You're more vulnerable to sovereign default. Uh, you're more vulnerable to inflation crisis, and we're already seeing the inflation crisis story play out of here. So if you go to any emerging market gathering, such as the ones in Davos, for example, what is the common chant or the common complaint that you hear right now from emerging markets? They're worried about inflation. Why are they worried about inflation? Because, well, capital inflows are not an unmitigated blessing. If you have a big inflow of capital, you have a big increase in the demand for your assets. So your currency appreciates. 
future, you know, the issues for the advanced economies. And again, the issues for the advanced economies are no more, more extreme than debt overhang, uh, the, the unemployment problems, the uh, um, issues pertaining to, to uh, uh, protracted slumps uh, are no more, more manifest than in many of the European economies. Uh, don't forget that if we are complaining here, as we should, with 9% unemployment, the unemployment rate in Spain is over 20%. And the youth unemployment is about 40%. So, you know, it, it's, it's an advanced economy problem, which will bring me to when I do my forward-looking, I mean, everything that I would say is forward-looking because these things are not going to wait. So that's part of the message. There are no quick fixes. I mean, I am still waiting for the day that I will go to the doctor and they will tell me, look, Carmen, you can lose weight without dieting and without exercise. <laughs> but that hasn't happened yet. And, and unfortunately, the situation of overcoming the dead overhead is a lot like profile. This is our total outstanding debt, public and private. And you see that there is some deleveraging since the crisis, but those debt levels remain extremely high. So how many of you have heard in the press about the new normal? You know, the re reference to the new, new normal. Well, let us there, if, if anyone interested, I'd be happy to send you the work that Vincent Reinhardt and I did for the Jackson Hole Conference. We don't think the new normal is an apt characterization. The new normal, has a sense that the old one was normal. That is, that the 10 years before the crisis were normal, and in fact, they were not. Look at that buildup in debt. Look at that red line soar in the 10 years before the subprime. We had, as many countries in Europe had, a debt fuel expansion. And the unwinding of that is going to be a long, I know that's not obvious, but it is honest. And since I'm not running for office, you know, I can at least be honest. Um, no offense to Okay, so now, what about, what does this mean? So I've painted a picture in which the advanced economies are facing a fairly protracted period of so far growth, but have to deal with the fact that there's a lot of debt, public and private. And let me say that the distinction between public and private is a very elusive one. Because in the United States, in the first quarter of 2010, Fannie and Freddie, which were the giants that were still, if you look at the balance sheet of the US economy up to 2009, Fannie and Freddie were considered private entities. Only in the first quarter of 2010, where they shifted to the public sector balance sheet. And take a guess how much that added to US government debt 25 percentage points. So if you look at this, is, I'm not, and this is not a seat of the pants, and I'm not making this up, go to the flow of funds data of the Federal Reserve, which is what I'm showing here. And when you take federal debt, net, not even gross debt, net debt. So you're netting out the social security stuff. State and local debt and state enterprise growth. That uh, level for the public sector is about 125% of GDP. That is an all-time high, and it has surpassed the previous high, which was in 1946. Uh, so, you know, what, what does a country what have we done before? And this is something that I like to pull out as a tool for thought. Thus far, if you talk, just think of, you know, whether you're, you're looking at a discussion of European issues or Japanese issues or, or U.S. issues. 
What is the talk of restructuring to write off uh, the debt, to give a haircut? And if you look at the price of Greek debt and Irish debt, what you see is the, those debts are traded as a standard discount, like 46 cents to the dollar, which already prices in the odds of a default. But there's a third thing we did right after World War II, which nobody's talking about. So I and one of my very excellent PhD students, Maria Belén Francia, and I just finished a paper, and it's called The Liquidation of Government Debts. And it looks at what the advanced economies did after World War II. You know, when people hear the term financial repression, they think I'm going to talk about emerging markets in 1980s, or I'm going to talk about China, because China has a financially repressed system. We know they have capital controls, they have interest rate ceilings, they have directed credit, all these things, interest rate ceilings, directed credit, capital control, all of that are forms of financial repression. But the fact is, all the advanced economies after World War II had very tightly regulated financial markets under Bretton Woods. So do you know that, of course, you were not born at the time, <laughs> but do you know that in 1976, uh, in 1972, for example, um, uh, the average U.S. person could not buy gold. So gold, purchases of gold were prohibited between 1933 and 1974. Do you know that until 1982, Regulation Q prohibited paying interest rates on deposits and capped the amount of interest rates banks could pay on saving accounts? Um, did you know that, well, until the 1980s, uh, many of the European economies had substantive uh, capital controls. And that France, for example, had directed lending for state enterprises until well into the 80s. This was a way of keeping interest rates controlled. When you have a lot of government debt, a little bit of inflation coupled with low interest rates goes a long way to liquidate government debt. Real interest rates were the norm between 1945 and 1980 in the advanced economies. And this is not seen in the past. This is stuff we've allowed to and that is a polite way of saying we're taxing you, but we're not telling you we're taxing you. And that's what it is. It's a tax on bondholders. It's a tax. You can call it a tax. You can call it polite restructuring. But if you think I'm kidding, here's another one for, where's my statistician right back there? All right. Okay, here's another pair of frequency distributions. This time, it is real interest rate. This is inflation-adjusted interest rates on treasury bills. This is for all the advanced economies from 1945 to 2009. There are two frequency distributions. The blue one shows real interest rates, that is nominal interest rates. So let's say a treasury bill yields 2%, that inflation is 3%, then your real interest rate is minus 1%, it's negative. So the borrower, in this case the government, is receiving a transfer from what's being subsidized by those that hold government debt. Uh, and in the blue frequency distribution, these are real interest rates on treasuries during the financial repression era. And the purple frequency distribution are in the more liberalized era of 1981-2009. What I'm suggesting to you is that that purple distribution is heading south. That we are going to see because governments in most of the advanced economies are tackling the huge debt overhang. That we're likely to see measures. We won't call it financial repression. It's not politically correct. We're going to call it prudential regulation. 
And if you don't believe me, look at some of the convention regulations put forth in the Baal III agreement. There is very preferential treatment of government debt. Uh, we have, in, in, in the early 1990s, when liberalized and lace affair capital markets and lace affair financial system were the, the things that, that were hot, the, 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 the fashion of the day. And Chile introduced capital controls to keep too much capital from coming in. Chile was widely criticized. Now, Chile, Malaysia, Colombia, not Colombia, sorry, Brazil, uh, um, India and others have moved more towards control-like measures on imports based on the prudential considerations that we saw. High capital inflows make you more price control. So it's not crazy to talk about measures to keep uh, capital at bay. What I am getting at is that we have moved from a period of very repressed financial right after World War II, during the Bretton Woods era, to very liberal, globalized capital markets in the 1990s and 2000s, and that we're moving to more controlled environment in the years forward. And the aim of that is to keep very clear aim to keep nominal interest rates low. And keeping nominal interest rates low helps reflate what are very depressed asset prices. Uh, it could also help with the unemployment situation by work making working capital for the firms cheaper. But importantly, it also keeps interest costs for the government at bay. Um, and so, how does this happen? I mean, it's much more uh, straightforward to talk about controlling financial markets after World War II. After all, look, you, you know, most of, most of the world had been through first the Great Depression and then a global, you know, a, a world war. So countries had a lot of capital controls in place and such. We, very different situation from now. I think you don't look for announcements that we're going back to Bretton Woods or that financial repression, you know, the financial repression act of 2011. But you look for our measures, prudential, prudential measures that foster financial institutions holding more government debt. Let me give you a concrete example. The UK, which next to the US is one of the most, or is the most laissez-faire of capital markets. During the height of the crisis, 
1990. Growth in Japan from 1950 to 1991 averaged just under 6%, and about a little over 1% since then. Uh, asset prices, real estate prices have fallen by about 50%, almost nonstop. The Nikkei has fallen by about three quarters, 75%. These are big hits to income growth and wealth. So to get to your question, the, it's, the sociologists have done attitude surveys of young Japanese, that is, kids that primarily have known only the post-bubble economy. And expectations have shifted downward from what they were. Not unlike what we saw around the Depression, savings patterns in America were quite different for quite a while after the Depression, the Depression, post-Depression. I suspect Having persistence in all the consumption studies is great. This is not something that you adjust to right away. But I think some of that is, is, is going to go on. And it's not a pretty answer, but I think, honestly, some of that is going to go on. It happens certainly also. It's not a cultural thing. It's, it's, it's the persistence of the change, uh, which was the, that kind of persistence was there in Japan, that kind of persistence was there after the Depression. In much more extreme form, of course, much more extreme because I'm not I'm not comparing the in the depression we had, you know, real incomes falling by a third. That's that a different order of magnitude. I'm not comparing that. I'm not, I'm not making that comparison. But I mean, in terms of expectations, of, for example, or attitudes toward debt. Well, thank you very much. What worries me is uh, that America seems to be too impatient to pay off its debt. And what I've learned is that uh, the big debt of World War II was never paid off. It just grew out of it. And so I'm thinking, isn't this a time where we should first stimulate the economy in the short term and then pay off the debt? What's your comment? It's a very valid point. How can I, you know, uh, it's a very valid point. Um, the, but I want to highlight one enormous difference, enormous from World War II. World War II, we had government debt, and we didn't have private debt. I mean, uh, and, and, and this is, look, this is, this is the end of World War II, and this is total U.S. debt, okay? So right now we have public debt, and private debt. A lot of the private debt will become public debt. Uh, the post-World War II experience, the growth importantly came from rebuilding Europe. Europe is in a very different shape right now. So, I, you know, last year, a year from uh, a year a year ago, when I testified before Congress, which lost in because this, this economy is still a crater. A year has elapsed, I think the economy has shown signs of recovery that were there a year ago. But also our debt has been 
there is a huge vested interest uh, on keeping the euro. And let me say this, you know, we hear about all oh, Germany's massive transfers to, to Greece and transfers to Ireland and transfers. Germany is not doing this for altruistic motives. Let us be very clear about this. If you look at the 1970s, when the U.S. had very expansive monetary policy, this is the breakdown of Bretton Woods. During that period in which Germany was growing rapidly relative to the U.S. as it is now, the, the Deutsche Mark appreciated against the dollar 60%. Now, the fact that they're tied to Ireland and to Greece and to Spain is actually capping that appreciation, and Germany is a very export-oriented. So this is not, what I'm trying to highlight is that the, the I am, I, I take restructuring as something that will happen. But I don't think, as others do, that restructuring is tantamount to the breakdown of the euro. And I do think that talk about transfers from Germany to, to the peripheral countries gets a lot of attention. I think it is neglected that the appreciation that the Deutsche Mark would have had today had it still existed is not a conjecture on my part. Look at what the Swiss franc has done. The Swiss franc has been appreciating significantly because it's sort of a proxy for what used to be the Deutsche Mark, even though Swiss fundamentals are actually not as anywhere close to, to German fundamentals. So in a nutshell, I do think the Euro's gonna survive. Of course, I, again, could be the laughing stock in five years, you know, I mean, just as the question the gentleman asked, you know, it, it's, it's my best understanding at the moment. Uh, but I, 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 and the reason I think it's going to survive is that they have a lot of vented, vested interests from different angles in keeping it alive. You know, uh, Greece and Portugal and, and Ireland gained a lot, crises notwithstanding, from joining the Eurozone. Um, and so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not one in which sort of signing off the, the, the death toll of the Dr. Reiner, you, uh, earlier you provided an example where uh, after a financial crisis, the level of public debt over three years went from 100 to 186 on the scale. You also mentioned that you believe that interest real rates will go negative, and that's how the U.S. government will potentially work on its problems. My question is, um, as that debt level expands, um, what is going to continue to entice Chinese and Japanese and other investors who continue to buy our bonds at such a low level of interest won't you know, yields on the 10 year spike upward and, and as a result not be real negative real interest rates. Um, who, will, who will continue to buy our bonds and, and won't they demand a higher rate of return uh, for investing our debt? Excellent question. Uh, excellent question. One of the things financial depression does is try to engineer ways, and I will be very specific in my answer, so I'm not just doing a, uh, on creating domestic captive audiences, okay? Right now, our pension funds, when you look, if actually, I invite you to go to the U.S. Treasury webpage to see the presentation that the committee that advises the Treasury on debt management did for the Treasury. There are wonderful slides that say, okay, here are the, if you look at pension funds in the US, the UK, Japan, and Italy, what share of their assets are in US government debt? It's very low. And, and who are the comparators? Japan and Italy, where they have the most financially repressed economy. So it, you're absolutely right that from the vantage point of foreign investors, such returns are not very attractive. I think through financial regulation, uh, we will get a higher participation rate in pension funds, in domestic financial institutions like banks, and even in households. Okay? And let me say what, what I think will help that. We have a vacuum 
that's been created in the last 15 years especially, before the crisis, we had the big growth of the mortgage-backed security market, which has basically gone off this planet. And the uh, government debt market does fill in a void in terms of long maturity, duration investments that has been vacated by, by the demise. So the other part to your excellent question is, why is it that the Chinese buy treasuries? They're not buying treasuries because they're looking for a good rate of return. They're buying treasuries because they want to avoid an exchange rate appreciation. And so if, if, you were, if you were telling me most of the holders of foreign debt in, for the U.S. are private individuals, I would tell you, you're absolutely right. We're going to need the, those higher interest rates to induce them to hold. But it's central banks who have a macro objective of avoiding an exchange rate appreciation, even at the cost of making losses on the assets that they're buying. Now, let me, because this is a real loaded question, let me, if, if, if you have the, some people have argued, no, 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 the emerging markets are buying U.S. treasuries, not because of this exchange rate motive or mercantilist motive or whatever you want to call it that, that I'm suggesting. They're buying it because they're saving for a rainy day. This is the legacy of the Asian crisis in which, you know, it was important to amass you know, a lot of liquid assets. Let us watch what Japan does at, at a moment like this. Japan is sitting on more than a trillion of U.S. treasuries. If you are saving for self-insurance, if you are saving for a rainy day, this classifies as a rainy day. And you would be selling those assets because that's what you do. That's why. But if it's if you're holding, if you bought the assets in the first place to avoid the appreciation of the yen, that's a different story. In a matter of fact, I have Vincent and I have an, a Financial Times op-ed that's coming out this morning, uh, tomorrow morning, on this very issue. 